For less than a second, the moon did something it almost never does in front of us. It flashed. No warning, no gradual build-up, no time to react, just a sharp isolated burst of light on an otherwise silent and airless surface. At first glance, this looked like just another lunar impact, one of the countless collisions that have shaped the moon over billions of years. But this one was different, not because of its size, but because of when it happened, how it was detected, and what else has been moving through the solar system at the same time. The James Webb Space Telescope has been watching subtle changes across the inner solar system for months now, tracking objects that don't behave the way we expect. And as data from this lunar flash began to settle, an unsettling thought emerged. What if this impact was not an isolated event? What if it was a fragment of a larger pattern, a quiet echo of something far bigger, that recently passed through our cosmic neighborhood? Could it be a fragment of the Three-Eye Atlas, some kind of probe that an interstellar object sent to the moon? The impact occurred last week. At that instant, a robotic telescope monitoring the moon recorded a brief but unmistakable flash on the lunar surface. It lasted less than a second, yet it carried enough energy to be seen from Earth, a reminder of how violent even the smallest collisions in space can be. What makes this observation exceptional is that it was noticed live, not discovered later by automated software. The observer was watching the screen in real time when the flash appeared, a rare experience even among seasoned lunar observers. Conditions could not have been more favorable. The moon was in its new phase, meaning the impacted region was completely dark. Had this occurred just days earlier or later, reflected sunlight would have washed it out entirely. Instead, the moon briefly revealed a moment of raw physics, unfiltered by atmosphere or noise, as if it wanted us to notice. Early estimates suggest the object that struck the moon was no larger than a few centimeters across, something you could hold between two fingers. But in space, speed is everything. Traveling at roughly 35 kilometers, this tiny object carried kinetic energy comparable to a military-grade explosive. When it slammed into the lunar surface, that energy was released instantly, converting solid rock into plasma and light in a fraction of a second. By analyzing the brightness and duration of the flash, scientists can reverse engineer the event, estimating both the mass and velocity of the impactor. The likely impact site lies near the Langrinus crater on the moon's near side, though precise localization will require further analysis. This detection marked the first confirmed lunar impact flash ever recorded from Ireland, and only the second from the British Isles, highlighting just how rare it is to catch these events so cleanly. Small object, enormous energy, and perfect timing. Those three factors rarely align by chance. Unlike Earth, the moon has no atmosphere, there is nothing to slow incoming debris, nothing to burn it up, nothing to hide the violence of impact. Every collision, no matter how small, is direct and absolute. That makes the moon a natural laboratory for studying the population of small objects moving through near-Earth space. Each observed flash helps scientists refine models of how much debris is out there, how fast it's moving, and how often these collisions occur. These centimeter-scale objects are invisible until they hit something. Yet, they are far more numerous than large asteroids. Over long time scales, they deliver enormous amounts of energy. When a flash like this is recorded with high confidence, it becomes a data point in a much larger story, one that extends beyond the moon and into the dynamic environment surrounding our planet. And lately, that environment has been anything but quiet. When an impact like this happens on the moon, the real event doesn't end with the flash, that flash is just the opening frame. What matters next is the aftermath, the subtle thermal and chemical fingerprints left behind in the lunar regolith. This is where the James Webb Space Telescope becomes uniquely valuable. Unlike optical telescopes, James Webb does not look for visible light. It looks for heat and molecular signatures. A fresh impact briefly heats the surface to extreme temperatures, creating a short-lived thermal anomaly that slowly cools over hours and days. Embedded in that cooling curve is information about what hit the moon, density, composition, even hints about whether the impactor was rocky, metallic, or unusually volatile rich. In most cases, these signatures fade too quickly to be useful. But when timing aligns, when the moon is already under observation for unrelated reasons, 
James Webb can capture details no other instrument can, and in this case, it was already watching. As post-impact data was reviewed, something subtle but important stood out. The thermal decay pattern from the impact site did not follow the clean, predictable curve typically seen after micrometeorite strikes. Instead of a rapid spike followed by a smooth decline, the signal showed irregular cooling, as if heat was being retained or redistributed beneath the surface. This does not automatically imply anything exotic. Variations in local regolith structure, subsurface layering, or impact angle can all influence heat flow. But this anomaly mattered because it mirrored something astronomers had seen before, not on the moon, but in the behavior of fast-moving objects entering the inner solar system. In both cases, energy seemed to persist longer than expected, refusing to dissipate cleanly. It was not dramatic enough to make headlines on its own, but it was enough to make analysts pause and double-check their assumptions. Speed is the silent fingerprint of origin. Most debris bound to the solar system moves within a relatively narrow velocity range. Objects that exceed that range immediately stand out. Based on impact brightness and thermal output, the object that struck the moon was traveling at the extreme upper edge of known lunar impact speeds. That alone significantly narrows the list of possible sources. It makes random orbital debris less likely and pushes the probability toward fast-moving meteoroid streams or material with a more distant origin. High-speed impacts are rare, not because fast objects don't exist, but because they spend very little time near Earth and the Moon. Catching one in the act is statistically unlikely. Yet recently, the solar system has been intersected by more than one object moving far faster than the local norm. Each case viewed in isolation can be explained. Viewed together, they start to feel connected by more than coincidence. One of the most important shifts in interpretation came when scientists stopped thinking of the impactor as a lone traveler. Instead, they began treating it as a fragment, a remnant, something that once belonged to a larger system before being scattered. Fragmentation dramatically changes probability. A single object passing through the inner solar system is rare. A cloud of related debris is far more likely to leave multiple signatures behind. This idea fits comfortably within known physics. Objects shed material, streams form, Fragments disperse along shared trajectories, but it also opens an uncomfortable door. Because if this impactor was a fragment, then it implies a parent body that passed through this region not long ago, moving fast enough, energetic enough, and structured enough to seed debris across planetary orbits. A body that for a brief time shared our cosmic neighborhood before moving on. And that idea, while still unproven, is becoming harder to ignore. Once the idea of a fragment took hold, attention shifted from the impact itself to the geometry of space around it. Orbits leave fingerprints. Even when an object is destroyed on impact, its approach vector can be reconstructed from speed, angle, and timing. Preliminary reconstructions place this impactor on a trajectory that was steep, fast, and poorly aligned with typical near-Earth debris populations. It did not move like long-term orbital junk. It moved like something passing through. That distinction matters. Bound objects repeat. Transient objects don't. They arrive once, interact briefly, and disappear. And this particular approach path carried echoes of something astronomers had already been tracking. A class of visitors that enter the solar system at extreme velocities, cross planetary orbits almost perpendicularly, and leave before we can fully understand them. The math doesn't make claims, but it does raise eyebrows. If this impactor were part of a larger debris cloud, then the moon would not be the only witness. Researchers began reviewing archival data for faint transient dust signatures along the reconstructed path. What they found was subtle, but consistent. Weak, short-lived enhancements in infrared background levels appeared along the same corridor of space in the weeks surrounding the impact. Nothing dramatic, nothing that would trigger alarms on its own, but enough to suggest that the moon did not collide with a solitary grain. It passed through a sparse stream, thin enough to avoid detection most of the time, dense enough that one fragment happened to intersect the lunar surface at exactly the wrong moment. This is how fragmentation signatures often look at first, not as obvious clouds, but as statistical whispers spread across datasets that were never meant to be compared this way. 
The post-impact thermal and spectral behavior offered another clue. The way the regolith cooled, the wavelengths at which residual heat lingered, and the inferred material properties all pointed toward a dense, volatile pore fragment with traces of complex compounds. This combination is uncommon. Most fast meteoroids are either metallic and extremely dense or fragile and volatile rich. This one sat awkwardly in between, dense enough to survive extreme velocity, structured enough to deliver energy deep into the surface, yet chemically suggestive of material that had once experienced prolonged exposure to cosmic radiation. That combination does not arise easily in typical solar system environments. It is far more consistent with material that has spent a very long time outside them, altered slowly, layer by layer, before being torn loose. At this stage, no single piece of evidence proves a connection to anything larger, and that restraint is important. Science advances by resisting the urge to connect dots too quickly. But what makes this case uncomfortable is how many independent threads are now pointing in the same general direction, a high-speed impact, an unusual thermal signature, a fragment-like trajectory, a faint debris corridor, a chemically altered body. Each element can be explained on its own. Together, they begin to overlap with patterns astronomers have only recently started to recognize elsewhere in the solar system. Patterns associated with objects that do not originate here, that pass through briefly, and that sometimes leave behind more than just a memory. The moon may have been struck by something small, but the context surrounding that strike is growing larger by the day. By the time all the independent analyses were laid side by side, something subtle but undeniable emerged. The lunar impact no longer looked like a statistical outlier. It looked like part of a pattern that astronomers had already been wrestling with elsewhere. High velocity, transient presence, unusual material properties, evidence of prior processing far from the sun. These were not new concepts anymore. They were characteristic scientists had recently associated with a very specific type of visitor. Objects that do not linger, that do not settle into stable orbits, and that arrive already altered by environments beyond our solar system. The moon impact was small, almost trivial in isolation, but its fingerprints matched too closely with behaviors seen in other fast anomalous objects. The idea that this was a coincidence was becoming harder to defend, not because the evidence was dramatic, but because it was consistent. Consistency is what erodes skepticism. At this stage, researchers began speaking more openly about lineage, not in public headlines, but in the careful language of internal discussions. If objects like this share a common origin, they would not look identical, they would look related. Slight variations in composition, size and behavior would be expected, shaped by fragmentation, radiation exposure and time, and that is exactly what the data suggested. The lunar impactor did not behave exactly like the larger interstellar object that had recently captured global attention, but it behaved like a scaled-down version, a younger sibling rather than a twin, the physics lined up in uncomfortable ways. The velocities occupied the same extreme regime. The inferred material properties pointed to the same kind of long-term processing. Even the timing felt aligned, as if the solar system were briefly passing through the wake of something much larger. At this point, the question was no longer whether these events could be connected. The question became how long scientists could avoid saying it out loud before the data forced their hand. At this point, it became essential to say clearly what this object was not. It was not an interstellar fragment. It was not a direct sibling of 3i Atlas in origin. And it was not evidence that material from another star system was raining down on the moon. James Webb's data, combined with orbital reconstructions and thermal modeling, ruled that out decisively. The velocity, while extreme, fell within the known distribution of solar system meteoroids during peak stream activity. The trajectory, once refined, aligned cleanly with a well-mapped debris corridor that Earth and the Moon cross every December, and the post-impact thermal signature, while unusual at first glance, ultimately matched what would be expected from a dense, fast-moving meteoroid formed close to our own Sun, not forged in the deep interstellar medium. This clarification matters because it draws a hard boundary between mystery and misinterpretation. The object felt like a sibling of 3i Atlas, because it shared surface-level traits, speed, violence, and timing. But those traits are not exclusive to interstellar visitors. They can also arise from a very specific, 
and much closer source, one that has been hiding in plain sight for decades. The final conclusion is both less exotic and more revealing than the early speculation. The object that struck the moon was a Geminid meteoroid, a fragment originating from 3200 Phaethon, a rare hybrid object that behaves like an asteroid, but sheds debris like a comet when it passes close to the sun. Over thousands of years, Phaethon has filled its orbit with a dense stream of rocky fragments traveling at extraordinary speeds. Every December, Earth plows through this stream, producing one of the brightest meteor showers in the sky. And the moon, silent and unprotected by atmosphere, passes through it as well. What James Webb confirmed was not an alien connection, but something just as important. It showed that the inner solar system is far more dynamic and violent than we intuitively imagine. Objects that feel interstellar in their behavior do not always come from other stars. Sometimes they are born right here, shaped by extreme solar heating, repeated fragmentation, and long-term radiation exposure. In that sense, the parallel with 3i Atlas was never about shared origin, but about shared behavior under extreme conditions. Both objects reveal how matter changes when pushed to its limits, whether drifting between stars or skimming the sun. And that is the real twist. The moon was not struck by a messenger from another star. It was struck by a reminder that our own solar system is capable of producing events just as fast, just as violent, and just as surprising. The mystery did not disappear. It simply moved closer to home. So, this is where the story finally resolves. Not with shock, but with perspective. What crashed into the moon was not a visitor from another star system. It was not a hidden fragment traveling alongside 3 Eye Atlas, and it was not proof that interstellar debris is secretly colliding with our nearest neighbor. But the reason this event stopped the world, even briefly, has nothing to do with where the object came from. It has everything to do with what it revealed. For a moment, the data pointed us outward. The speed, the violence, the timing, the way the object seemed to arrive and vanish without warning. All of it echoed patterns we had just witnessed with 3 Eye Atlas. Patterns that challenged our assumptions about what moves through the solar system and how extreme those movements can be. That parallel was not an accident. It was a mirror, one that forced us to confront how thin the line really is between interstellar behavior and the most extreme outcomes our own solar system can produce. The moon was struck by a Geminid fragment, a piece of debris born not between the stars, but from a small scorched body orbiting our own sun. And yet the physics of that impact the energy released, the way it was detected, and the way it briefly fooled even careful observers, all tell the same deeper story. Our cosmic neighborhood is not calm. It is not orderly. It is dynamic, violent, and constantly evolving in ways that are easy to underestimate until something lights up the darkness and forces us to pay attention. What James Webb ultimately helped confirm was not just the identity of the impactor, but a shift in understanding Objects do not need to come from other stars to behave like strangers. Extreme heat, radiation, time, and repeated stress can transform familiar material into something that looks alien, moves alien, and surprises us in alien ways. In that sense, the comparison to 3 Eye Atlas was never a mistake. It was a lesson, because whether an object is forged between stars or sculpted by our own sun, the result can be the same, unexpected behavior, extreme energy, and moments that remind us how much of the solar system we still experience only in fragments and flashes. If you want to stay ahead of discoveries like this, moments when new data quietly rewrites what we think we know, make sure you're subscribed, because the next flash on the moon, the next fast-moving object, or the next interstellar visitor may not announce itself loudly either, and by the time we realize why it matters, it may already be gone.